The Dharma doesn't change. That's why it's one of the reasons why it's said to be akaliko, timeless. The Buddha was wise enough to see what it is in the, his mind, what it was in his mind that was universal. It's one of the reasons why Buddhism was the first world religion. It didn't have to do anything with any tribe or somebody's vision of a spirit who came and spoke especially to one group of people. It focuses on a universal problem and a universal solution. The problem is the suffering we cause ourselves. And the principles by which we do that were the same in India in the Buddhist time as they are now. So even though the Dharma may not have lots of new new things to, to tell you with the passing of time, That's actually one of its virtues. Its lessons stay the same. I appreciated this when I was staying with the John Fuhr. That once you'd learned the principles, you could live by them. And he was the sort of person who wasn't going to change things just to please people. And it wasn't that people weren't making demands. We think that it's only here in the West that people say things have got to change. But you've seen it in Thailand for, for centuries. This has to change, that has to change. To the point where the traditions of Thai and Laotian Buddhism were so far removed from the Dharma that when a, a John Mun was trying to go back to the original principles, they accused him of being out of line. But the image they give in the canon is of a drum. At first it's kind of good sounding. It's made out of wood. It sounds for far. But then a crack develops in the wood, and so you put in a peg, another crack, and another peg, and another crack, and another peg. And finally the, the drum is nothing but pegs. And when you beat the drum you can hardly hear it. In other words, the changes that are sometimes brought to the Dharma may seem to be a, a good fix for the time being, but then it turns out they don't really have the same impact, they don't have the same power, is what the Buddha originally taught. And so we keep coming back. The same principles all over again, the same problem, the suffering we're causing ourselves. And the same solution, the Noble Eightfold Path. The Buddha called these truths noble because he said they are factual, true, and not otherwise than what they seem. There's another passage in the canon where they say the truths are noble because they are taught by the Noble One, i.e. the Buddha. And some people have said, well, in that case it means they're true only for noble people, and they're not true for us. That's not the case. They're true for everybody. As the Buddha said, they're categorical, which means they're always true, always beneficial, no matter where you go. It's only two of his teachings he said were categorical, that and the teaching that skillful qualities should be developed and unskillful ones should be abandoned. And the two principles come together, because the noble truths are not just ideas that sit there. Each truth has a duty, and the cause of suffering and the cause of stress is something that should be abandoned, and the path is something that should be developed. Simply, the four truths take those two principles of skillful and unskillful qualities and divide them up into cause and effect. So the cause of suffering is something you abandon, but the suffering itself is something you want to comprehend. 
the path is something you develop. And the cessation of suffering that arises, or, or is found, let's put it that way, at the end of the path. That's something you want to realize for yourself. So these are noble duties. And one of the reasons the truths are noble is because they make us noble. After all, when you look at your suffering, all you can think of is trying to push it away, push it away, and then holding on to your craving at the same time you're trying to push away the results of the craving. There's nothing really noble about that attitude. What's noble is when you realize that the way I feed, the way I cling to things, that's the suffering. I've got to do something about that. That attitude is a noble one. You're pulling away from your old feeding habits. You're taking a good look at them. It's in adopting that attitude that we get on the right path. Our search for happiness becomes a noble search. So always keep these principles in mind. These are the ones that make sure that your path is on is on the path. Put it that way. That what you're doing is actually leading to where you want it to go. And not wandering someplace else. We chant every night that Dharma is well taught. Timeless to be seen here and now. And it's the same Dharma every day, every day, every day. The problem is sometimes our attitude is in line with it, sometimes it's not. And you become mature in the teaching when you realize, okay, you've begun to stray off the path. And you can bring yourself back. And if we had lots of different dharmas, it'd be hard to do that, because today's dharma you might like this particular style, and the other day you might another another particular style. This is one of the reasons that the Buddha said that when counterfeit dharma appears, then the true dharma disappears. The concept that there is one true dharma is gone, because there are lots of different clamoring voices. This is one of the problems of living in a time when the true Dharma has disappeared in that sense. Because you will find a version of the Dharma that will please whatever defilement you have. But when you're honest with yourself and you look at the, what gets developed in the mind as you follow a particular interpretation or as you latch on to a particular idea, You can begin to gain a sense of what actually is the true Dharma. The true Dharma is still there. The analogy the Buddha gives is of genuine money and counterfeit money. When counterfeit money floods the market, he says genuine money disappears. Well, it's still there. It's just people get very dubious. But there are tests for genuine money that counterfeit doesn't pass. And the same with the Dharma. This principle is that the Buddha taught to his stepmother. Is does it lead to dispassion? Does it lead to being unfettered? Does it rouse your energy? Does it make you content? Does it help you shed things that are unskillful? Does it make you unburdensome? Does it make you modest, unentangled? Okay, that's the Dharma. The genuine Dharma will pass the test. Simply that we have to make ourselves good judges, judges that we can rely on. This is one of the reasons why we meditate, because you develop a lot of mindfulness and alertness. The alertness is important, because it's so easy to lie to yourself. That was one of John Cha's 
comments is one of the first things you notice as you really start watching the mind is how much it lies to itself. But we can't get past that. That's what that image of the Buddha had about the mind being luminous and the clouds come and go, just like the sun. The sun is luminous. Even though when the sun is covered by clouds, the sun itself is still luminous. There is a quality of the mind that can know. Luminous here doesn't mean it's pure. It doesn't mean that it's already, or already awakened. But it does have this knowing quality. You can't observe. You can't see for yourself what you're doing. And you can catch the mind if you're Mindfulness and alertness are continuous enough. You can catch the mind when it's lying to itself. So we develop these qualities so that we can rely on ourselves to be good judges. And of course, as we develop the qualities to be good judges, we also develop the qualities to be good Dharma practitioners. So every day, make sure that your intention is in line with the drama, which is the intention is for freeing the mind, looking for ways in which the mind binds itself down. And where, how does it do that? It's through its passions. We keep running up against this principle that the things that we cling to most, the things that we're most passionate about, those are the things that make us suffer, those are the things that tie us down. So of course it's going to go against the grain to practice. But there's a part of the mind that realizes that not practicing goes very strongly against another grain, which is the part of the mind that really wants to be free, that is tired of the ways in which it's been making itself suffer. That's the side of the mind you want to encourage. You want to make sure that it doesn't get buried. under all the other voices in the mind. So try to make your practice timeless. That's the only way you're going to know the timeless Dharma. And John Fung had that comment one time. It was a, one of the few Dharma talks he gave that was recorded to a large group of people that he, he had never met before. And he wanted to give them a message that they would stay with them. And this, was, and this was the message, that we live our lives, and as long as we keep dividing it up into different times, we'll never know the timeless drama. And we don't have much time. So if you want to know the timeless drama, you've got to make the practice timeless and have a very strong sense that you've got to use it right now. You've got to do it right now. You can't put it off. And John Mahabhu once made a comment. He said that people who think that rebirth would be a good idea, a good thing, don't really understand rebirth. It's scary that everything gets pulled away from you, all the things you've depended on in this lifetime. And you may have some good that you've done, but you don't know what you've got in the past. The possibility for falling is very strong. So we do have this life right here, right now. We do have this opportunity right here, right now. When you think of the word timeless, it tends to put things in a long stretch of time away from right here, right now. But no, that timelessness is right here, right now, strongly connected, that you're going to practice right now. If you're at work in the kitchen, you're practicing right now. If you work in the orchard, you're practicing right now. Whatever you're doing as you go through the day, make it a right now kind of practice. And that's how it becomes timeless. And it's in the timelessness of the Dharma that the noble quality of the Dharma comes out. 
It really does raise the level of your mind. It pulls you away from your old feeding habits, from your old attachments, and it gives you freedom of a very noble sort.